Hey, hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Intro to Backend Development Lectures. This week we're on Lecture 5. We'll be talking about containerization, which is the first in kind of a two-part lecture series about containerization and deployment. So how are we getting our code to actually run somewhere on the internet so that people can actually access it? First, you know, as always, let's do a quick recap of what we did last week. We talked about object relational mapping, which just converted that raw SQL code we were writing in uh, PA2, PA3, into Python code. And this is good for um, a number of reasons, depending on who you ask. Uh, in my opinion, I think it helps debug. It's much easier to catch some syntactic Python errors, say if you're missing a parentheses in a function call or something like that, than it is to catch a SQL error, right? Because if you're running your Python code and you have it in the SQL kind of string format we were working with for PA2 and PA3, then you're not going to know until you get some runtime error in the middle of operating your server that's like, hey, um, yeah, your insert syntax is wrong, and it's wrong, like, somewhere near the word into, but good luck figuring out where. Also, good luck figuring out which one. Right, it's just a lot more convenient to work with, with Python-specific debugging. There is definitely an argument for working with raw SQL. Uh, Jack, I know, is, is actually a big fan of just working with raw SQL. But in general, most people would agree that ORMs are more. Especially because they automatically handle a lot of nice stuff for you. They handle reference conditions. They handle, for me, the big thing is they handle join tables for you, right? Remember when we were working with raw SQL, we had to make the join table. We had to specifically, like, make a call to the join table to figure out what all of the things we were related to were and then make another call to the table. Like, tasks has to figure out, oh, uh, let's find out what categories I'm related to using the join table. And then we get all their IDs. And then we're like, okay, now using all of these IDs, let's actually get all of the category information. And it was just a hassle, right? In PA4, y'all probably noticed you didn't have to do much with the, with the association table or the join tables, right? You created them, and then you set them as a secondary in that db.relationship. And then SQL Alchemy just handled it for you, right? It was like, okay, if you want to get uh, a user's courses, do user.courses. We'll, we'll fill it in for you. So convenient. All right, on to today's lecture. How do we run apps on other machines? Containerization. First, let's just quickly go into why we might want to do this. Um, there's a couple obvious reasons, right? It's not like if you're working at Google, everybody is just taking turns being code goblins at a computer and being like, hey, hey, it's my turn to work on the server. You've had your five minutes, right? Like, that's just obviously not going to work out. You might say, okay, well, what if they have a bunch of different computers that they're editing the code on, and then they all deploy to one computer? Well, then we run into some other issues of one computer just can't really handle all that traffic. We might need to have a bunch of servers, and I know for a fact that Google probably has thousands of servers, uh, maybe more, just to handle all of the web traffic they get. And these things all somehow need to have the same code on them, have to be deployed all of the same way. It has to be all the same code, right? So how do we keep these things consistent, and how do we run these apps on other machines? The other thing is, you know, we've been running code on our computers. What if we want to run an app somewhere, right? We can't just run it off of our computer. That's a security risk, uh, right? We don't want people from, from outside just accessing our computer's IP addresses. So we'll, house, we'll host it somewhere online. One thing we'll talk about in relation to that are environments. Uh, and all that an environment is is kind of the system surrounding your code that it's running inside. One important part of which is the environment variable. So environment variables are usually stored in something called a .env file. Sometimes they're stored in a .envrc file, which is, you know, if you see that, it's the same idea. Um, it's just used slightly differently. And the things you store in a .env file are usually things you'll want to keep secret or not public, but that are still important to your code. Um, so, for example, let's say you're working on a code that interfaces with Twitter or Yelp, right? You're probably going to need to register to, to make requests to those sites. And when you register, they'll send you some long key that's like, okay, when you make a request to us, send this key along with it, and that'll let us know to unlock the site to give you whatever request you want. Registered, here's your key. You probably don't want that key to be public, right? You just store it in some .env file, and then you can load it into your code. The other part of the environment is really all of the, the libraries you're working with, the dependencies. 
So in Python, we've been using Venv, right? The virtual environment. Uh, we've been giving you a requirements.txt and you know, every assignment y'all have just been hip installing that. Now we get to actually explain to you what that does, right? Uh, requirements.txt is really just a list of dependencies. And then pip install says, hey, go through all of these dependencies and install them into my virtual environment. The reason we want a virtual environment is because pip actually by default installs things globally. Neither here nor there. Um, virtual environments are useful just to keep things local. Right? It's also nice because then we just compile our requirements.txt. And then all we have to do to hand off our code to someone else is be like, hey, just pip install this. You don't have to go through each dependency one by one, right? It's a really good way to modulate codes. Another thing is package conflicts. Here's the reason we want to use virtual environments as opposed to, you know, just pip installing globally. Here's an example. Let's say project A and project B both use the requests package. But project A is old as all heck, and it uses version like 0.1. Project B uses version 3. Right? And you're working on both of these projects, ostensibly, you know, on your own computer. What do you do, right? Let's say, there's a depend let, let's say there's a version conflict between these two things, and you can't actually use version 3 for the same stuff you would have used point 0.1 for. Well, with virtual environments, it's not that bad, right? You create a virtual environment in Project B's folder, and install request version 3 into that, and Project A folder is sitting comfortable using request version point 0.1 for whatever reason it's doing that. If you installed things globally, then it would just get kind of messy because you would have to say, okay, I'm using 0.1 right now, and then let me just switch it to version 3 later. No. Bad practice. We want to keep things close to where they are, right? In this case, we want to keep the libraries close to where we're using them, right? We're using version 3 in project B, version 1 in project A. Keep it in the virtual environments for those. Now, here's a small-scale approach, right? And this is what we've really been doing for, for y'all. You have Python, you have your requirements.txt, you pip install it, and then you run up that pi, right? That's what you've been doing the whole time, and it's, it's been working, right? Here's the problem, right? When you get into bigger applications, say you have databases, you have a bunch of different package installations, you have like a billion different things going on, it starts to get unmanageable really quick, right? Bigger projects often have multiple different projects within them, uh, and just kind of managing all of that at once, it's not sustainable, right? And it just, uh, like, you know, if you edit one thing, all of a sudden you're editing the whole project, and that's just, that's just bad coding practice, right? We don't want the whole project to get screwed up because you edited one little part of it. So we want something more, more modular, and we want something more automated, right? If we're deploying to a thousand different servers, we don't want to have to go through the process of, hey, okay, so let's, push all of our code to, to GitHub or something, let's go into this server, git pull, uh, let's run app.py. There's like a ton of installation instructions for a lot of these projects, right? Maybe we need to pip install requirements.txt. Oop, maybe we actually need some, some dependencies in the operating system before we can do that, right? Maybe we need to install Python first. We need to install Python, okay. Uh, maybe this project also uses Node. Okay, let's install Node. Uh, maybe this project also need some other things, right? It just keeps getting out of hand and it just increases the number of steps you have to do per server you're working. So, how might we think about doing this? There's a couple different ways we could, we could do this thing called virtualization. The first is virtual machines, right? And a lot of you have probably used these before, uh, maybe for, for different classes here and there. I'm pretty sure 3110 used to use these for, for Windows users. But recently, I, I think they've shifted to using the Windows subsystem for Linux instead. That aside, the idea behind a virtual machine is you are running a computer inside of your computer, right? It's segmented off from the rest of your code. You have a little window, and in this window, maybe you're running uh, an Ubuntu operating system, right? It's separated from the rest of our computer's files, and you can have multiple of these going on at once, right? Maybe you have like six or seven virtual machines all running different pieces of code that you want running. Well, when you're doing this on a server, um, the way that you manage all of those is through something called a hypervisor. So let's just kind of quickly look at you know, a diagram. We've got three virtual machines on a server running different parts of an app, right? It's not like Google's just one thing. It's got a lot of stuff going on. So Google has these three different parts of it for you. 
Those three virtual machines are all being managed by a hypervisor, and that's all over the existing machine infrastructure. This is, you know, on that virtual machine, a lot of space is being taken up by the operating system. And because we're running an entire like OS on top of the hypervisor, on top of all of this other stuff, VMs are slow. If you've used a VM on your computer, you know VMs are slow. So what are we doing instead? Let's talk about the deployment process. Instead of using a virtual environment, what if there was some way to just kind of take our code and put it in some system that tells other computers how to run it, right? We compress our code into something and it's like, okay, hey, if you want to install and run this code, here are exact steps you need to follow. And maybe these steps can be computer readable, right? Maybe they're in some sort of syntactic language so the computer can do these steps without any human help. This is gonna be split into four different steps. The first is compressing code into a production environment, right? That just talks about the differences between production environment and development environments. In dev environments, you might have a bunch of print statements flying around. You might have, you know, a bunch of debugging stuff you thought were useful that might actually slow down your code, right? But it was useful to you to make sure your code was right. Production, you want your code to be slick. You want it to be fast. Compress all of that out. You also want to make sure that it's run ready. So, you know, that's preparing all of the installation and stuff like that. Then we spin up the servers and make sure the servers have the environment on it. This lecture, we're really mostly going to be talking about steps one and two here. Next lecture is mostly going to be steps three and four. All right. So this process of kind of compressing our code into these different modules is called containerization. These are the same four things as before, moving on. So the first step is compressing our code into a production environment, right? And here's where Docker helps us. Docker has this fun whale logo, and it helps us package our code into a kind of standardized unit of software, right? When you think of containerizing something, right, you're putting it into a container, and you're packaging it all up super nicely. Your entire code, your environment is all packaged up so the server can run it. The way that Docker works is it builds your code into an image, and then it runs the image as a container. That probably meant nothing. I know when I first learned this stuff, I was like, image, container, words, what do these things mean, right? Well, an image is built out of the source code. You can think of it kind of like a, a blueprint of your code, right? When you, you can think of it like code itself, right? When you run code, it's not like you're actually running the text that you've typed, right? Your code gets uh, compiled into assembly and machine code and then run, right? So in, in kind of a way, your code is really just a blueprint for the machine code that it gets compiled or interpreted into. So you define a Docker image with a Docker file, and Docker files are that computer understandable installation instructions I was talking about before. A Docker file tells, uh, you know, an image exactly how it needs to set up the environment. So it's, it's the one that says, hey, make a virtual environment, hip install requirements.txt, run app.py. All of that stuff would be in your Docker file, and then it just does it all on its own. So once you have a Docker file in your in your directory, you just type docker build dot. That'll build all of this into a docker image. The docker container then is what's actually run, right? So you have this image, you have this kind of blueprint for how the server should be. Then what you do is when you want to put it on a server, you spin up a container out of that image. So a container is what's actually running on the server. Here's an analogy that might hopefully help out. Images are to containers as, you know, if you've worked in object-oriented languages, Java, C++, Python, as classes are to objects, right? A class is really just a blueprint for an object. It isn't an object, depending on the language you're in, but it tells you how to make one. Similarly, it's like a blueprint for a house, right? An image is kind of the diagram that tells you how to spin up a container. Recipes, cakes, uh, scores to music, the instructions, to the result of the instruction. And with Docker, things get a lot more streamlined, right? We don't have this overhead of having a bunch of different OSs running on a bunch of different VMs. We just have our one operating system, and then Docker runs on top of it, managing all of our applications, right? A lot of that overhead is gone. 
And a lot of the space is gone too, right? It's just slicker and faster. So, why is this good? The main thing is modularity. When you build a Docker file, now all you have to do is run your Docker image on a bunch of different servers. You don't have to go through a whole setup process every time. It's just on every server you get your Docker image, uh, and we'll tell you how you, you know, move your Docker images places. But for now, assume you can do that. On your server, you just kind of download your Docker image and then run it. It's a two-step process now. So it's faster for people to do. Uh, it requires free re resources because you're not using a whole VM each time. It's just overall better for management. Second step, preparing your production environment to be run ready. So this is the step where I mentioned, how are we moving our images? If you've used GitHub before, you know that it's the place where you can kind of upload your code into, into repositories, right? GitHub stores a bunch of different code repositories. Docker Hub is similar, except in storing your code, it stores Docker images. So you are working on your computer, you're working on PA. Five, because PA5 is actually, sorry, PA5 is actually making Docker containers. And you, you make your Docker file, you Docker build, and then you just Docker push all the way up to Docker Hub, which is some website that we have access to. Then later on, so in um, next lecture in PA6, what you'll be doing is you'll be going into some server you've created and then pulling from Docker Hub the image you create and then running it on your server. So here are the steps, right? Create the Docker file, build the image on your computer, push it all the way up to Docker, the Docker Hub, and then on the server, you can download it back from Docker Hub to run it. And if you'll notice, you can have multiple of these running on one server, right? If you want to handle more traffic, maybe you have five of these containers running at once, right? And keep in mind, I said containers there instead of images, right? Because you're pulling the image and you make the container out of the image. Docker Compose. Docker Compose is nice for running multi-container Docker apps. A lot of things need that. Here's a, a perfect example of something that you know, AppDev works with. Transit has a ton of containers running. Transit has a container that just handles routing. It has a container that handles you know, small stuff like getting delay information, getting routes, and then it has a main container that um, the front end actually hits. And the other two containers are just kind of internal for the back end. But we still need to have all of these containers running at the same time. Docker Compose files help us manage a lot of containers once. For the sake of this course, nothing we're doing is going to be complicated enough to need more than one container. But it's, um, it's a useful skill to know how to use a Docker Compose. We're going to be teaching you how to use it, and we're going to be expecting you to use it, I believe, in PS6. Maybe PS6. So, you know, for example, maybe your, your Docker containers, you need a Python container running, you need your Postgres container running, that's the elephant one. Uh, it's a type of database thing. Maybe you have a React app running, maybe you have a, a Flask app running. All of those are kind of held up by each of these different whale containers supporting one app. So in summary, you define the Docker file to say how to set up your environment, how to Provide all the installation instructions. It's your computer's version of a README, right? You've been on maybe some GitHub repositories and it's like, hey, README, here's how you set up this. Dockerfile is the computer readable version. You build the Docker image, push it, download it, run it using a docker compose.yaml. your server. All of this is kind of a subset of a topic called DevOps or development operations. DevOps are focused on shipping software quickly and efficiently, right? The two pieces are, you know, the development, the building, that's, you know, what we've been up to, and then the operations, which is testing and releasing. So DevOps is kind of combining these things because they, they're really not separate, right? When we build our software, we want to test it as we go to make sure that it's working, right? We want to be able to release easily the things that we've been developing. So these two things are really closely related. If testing is super important, right? We've been using Postman each time. What if you're working with an application that has a ton of different routes, like Google, right? Google's the prime example for this again, because, or maybe even Amazon, because they have so many routes that they have to work with. 
you can't, you can't feasibly postman every single one of those routes every time you make a change to your code to make sure they all still work. So instead, maybe you create a test suite for your code, and then you just run that test suite every time, and it's just a bunch of different test cases on your route, and then every time you update your code, you run the test suite, and as long as everything passes, you're good. That way you don't have to just postman and redo a lot of your effort every time. This is a really good diagram of what DevOps are, right? The development is the, the planning, the creating, making sure it's, it's working, um, packaging it up. That's the Docker stuff. And the operations, we want to release it. We want to configure it all to work. And then we want to monitor it, right? Things have to be maintained somehow. Uh, it's not like just because Eatery and Transit are released, we've we stopped working on them, right? We have to somehow maintain these apps and make sure that they're, they're working and working properly, right? That's the monitoring part. And then once we monitor things, we want to plan and figure out how it you know, works back. And it's just this loop. They're super tightly knit. Thanks. That's all for this week. Like I said, this is kind of a two-parter. So next week, we'll be talking about deployment. Um, specifically, how do we get our code onto these servers? We talked about Docker Hub, but like, how do we get a server in general, right? Where do we, where do we get that stuff? We'll talk about how to get into your server, which is SSHing once we've created one. Uh, then clustering and load balancing, which is all just more important once we actually get into hosting a bunch of things. So, uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this week's lecture. Good luck on on PA5. Hopefully it'll be a bit of a break after, after how long PA4 was. PA5 is a lot less code heavy, but you do need to make sure that Docker's set up really well. So if you look on the pre-class to-dos for today, make sure that you've got Docker running on your computer, make sure it is running correctly. That's something you will absolutely need for this assignment. All right, good luck guys, you got this.